We gather to worship this morning in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. This time we invited a Neil Sitter stand for a time of silent reflection on God's word and for self-examination. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you. For his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand as we join together in the reading of the psalm of the day, which comes from Psalm chapter 85. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet, righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. We join together in singing hymn number 652. Lord be with you. Let us pray. 
O Lord, you granted your prophets strength to resist the temptations of the devil and courage to proclaim repentance. Give us pure hearts and minds to follow your son faithfully even into suffering and death. To the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the scripture reading. The Old Testament reading this morning is from Amos chapter 7, beginning at verse 7. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, the king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah and eat bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may see as we join together and sing hymn number 824.
may be seated. I invite you, as you're taking your seats, to open a Bible to Ephesians chapter 1 as we dive into God's Word this morning to hear and learn about His grace in Jesus Christ. We go to Him in prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would speak to us words of comfort and grace this morning through the words of Jesus. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ, the Holy Spirit would uplift and encourage them through the hearing of the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning. And finally, I ask that you pray for me that I preach faithfully and truthfully the word of God and the gospel of Jesus and his grace for all to hear. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So the beginning of Ephesians is an amazing part of the scriptures because it has zero commandments. It has zero imperatives, which means in writing this letter, Paul spends half the letter not telling us to do anything. Right? When we think about Christianity, a lot of people, when they think about church, they think about Christianity, they think about God, they think about rules. They think about things that you're supposed to do, things you're supposed to not do, and if you do the good things, you're a good person. If you do the bad things, you're a bad person, and you've got to be good to get God's love, right? This is what Martin Luther called the natural condition of the human heart, is that one of religion, that we think that in order to get God to be pleased with me, to love me, then I need to do good things in order to earn his love. Now, I know many of you are good Lutherans. You've been Lutheran all your life. You're like, absolutely not. We're not saved by works. We're saved by what? We're saved by grace, right? But the other thing that Luther said is that you and I need to be reminded of the gospel every day because every single day we forget it. We forget that we are saved by grace, and our natural condition is I've got to do better, right? Anybody ever told yourself that this is the week I'm going to do better for God? This is the year I'm going to be a better Christian. I'm going to treat better people. I'm going to do the things that God wants me to do better, right? And while we want to strive for sanctification, we want to become more like Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, one of the beautiful things about the book of Ephesians is that Paul writes the first three chapters without ever giving a command. It's just nothing but pure grace and pure praise of how God loves you. So here's the big idea that I want you to get this morning, even if you've heard it before, is that God loves you loves you, all right? And you go, well, how would I forget that? I'm like, well, I don't know, because you and I are under attack by sin. We're under attack by our sinful nature. We're under attack by the devil all the time to forget this simple truth that we teach children from a young age that Jesus, God, loves you. We forget it. We forget that he forgives me, that he has given me his grace and mercy. We forget that we have been loved perfectly by him and that we don't have to do anything to make him love us more. And this is what Ephesians 1, what our epistle reading is all about. So we're going to start in verse 3. Today is going to be a, a little more like a Bible class. We're just going to go verse by verse looking at these profound truths that Paul teaches us. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So Paul's going to use some fancy theological terms. One of the terms he's going to use is this idea of predestined, that God has chosen us. And what this is, is it's a picture of God's extreme love for you. This is a beautiful promise when Paul says and writes that God chose you before the foundations of the world. What that means is before you were born, before you did anything good or bad, God, through Jesus Christ, had a plan to redeem and save you. What that does is it gets rid of that notion of, I'm going to save myself, right? One of the subtle ways that we fall into this trap as Christians is we think that God did most of the work and I just got to meet him halfway. Or Jesus did most of the work and I just got to take that one last step of faith. And what Paul is saying is, before you existed, so what were you doing before you existed? Nothing, right? It's not a trick question. You were doing nothing. You were contributing nothing. And Paul is saying, before you did anything, good or bad, 
God chose you out of love in Jesus to redeem you and save you and adopt you as his child. So when a devil comes along and tempts you and tries to deceive you because this is what he's done since the very beginning of whether or not God's love for you is true, what Paul is saying is absolutely it's true. It was before you were born, it was before you existed, and before you did anything right or wrong, he was working to redeem you through Jesus Christ. That is a wonderful definition of what we like to call grace, that I didn't earn it, I didn't work for it, I didn't make up for past mistakes or past sins to prove to God that I was really sorry. Instead, through Jesus, he looked into the future and said, I'm adopting this one as my child. They belong to me. And then it says at the end of verse four, in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. So it's in love, right? Sometimes we, I meet people that get nervous about this, predestined idea of God choosing us and God acting to rescue us and redeem us, but Paul defines it as an act of love. Later on in Ephesians and other letters, Paul describes us being in sin as being dead in our trespasses, right? We are dead in our sins. And the image that Paul is using, yes, he's using a very stark image of someone who has died, and he's saying, dead people don't do things. Dead people don't wake up on their own. They don't have any power within them to do anything. It's what he's saying is you and I were dead in our sins. We didn't have the power to wake up one day and say, today's the day I'm going to be a good person for God. He says in Ephesians that God has adopted you in love, that he looked at you in your sins Because unfortunately, as much as we don't like to talk about it, you and I are sinners. We are imperfect people. We make mistakes. We come up short. And you know what God does when he sees a sinner? According to God's word, he says, in love, he adopted you. In love, he made you his child. So he looked at you and me, dead in our sins, in our rebellion against him, and instead of casting us aside, instead of saying, you are worthless to me, you rebelled, you get what you deserve, he looked at you and me and says, I'm going to make you alive, I'm going to adopt you and make you my child. And here's the good news, you had nothing to do with that. Right, now some of you are looking at me like, that doesn't sound good. No, it is good news. Because you and I are sinners who choose our sin. Here's my evidence for the fact that you and I choose our sin. How many of you have ever done the same sin more than one time even though you felt bad about it? Yeah, probably more than one time, right? <laughs> probably a few dozen, hundred thousand times. Like, man, I can't believe I keep going back to it. And so this is the good news. In our sin, guess what you and I would do? We would choose to keep going back to our sin. This is what Proverbs said. It says, a fool returns to his folly over and over again. A fool returns to his folly, a sinner returns to their sin over and over again, unless someone greater than us, more powerful than our sin, comes and rescues us. But you see, when God looks at you and me in our sin, he doesn't look at someone to be condemned or destroyed or forgotten. He looks at someone that needs adoption. And so Paul says it is in love that he predestines us for adoption to himself, saying you belong to him. You are part of the family forever. Both my baby sisters are adopted. When my oldest sister, who's now going off to college, was adopted, she was 10 months old. My parents went over to China to get her, and as soon as they signed the papers over there with the government, she was part of our family immediately. And there was no way to remove her from our family. She immediately became, if you've ever been around adoptive families, what we call the forever family, all right? Both my sisters, that was the ruling. When the judges said, you belong to this family, that was the end of it. There was nothing to overcome that ruling. There was nothing to change that. They became part of our family forever. When Jesus, the judge, adopted you and redeemed you as his child and brought you to the Father's family, that was the end of it. You belong to him forever. You are part of God's forever family. And as Jesus says in John chapter 10, no one can snatch you out of my hands. 
Not the devil, not sin, not you yourself. You belong to Jesus and his family forever. So this is such good news that when Paul says it was in love that he adopted you, it was out of love that he looked at you and your sins and said, you now belong to me. I'm the judge. Jesus is the judge, right? So when he says you belong to the Father, guess what? That decision is final, and you belong to the Father, and you belong to his family forever. You are part of God's forever family. And so he says that we adopted as his sons according to the purpose of his will, verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So what he's saying is this very simple idea that if you've ever been in church before, you've probably heard once upon a time, hopefully more often than once, that Jesus forgives your sins. Amen? All right. Simple truth, easy to forget. I remember one time being asked early on in my ministry by somebody because they counted how many times I mentioned Jesus in a sermon, and apparently it was a lot, which I thought was a good thing, okay? And I kept, keep doing that. I'm going to keep doing it with y'all. You can complain all you want. I'm not going to stop, all right? And they go, when are you going to move on to the real stuff of faith? Right? And the idea being, when are you going to get to the real stuff about how to have a better marriage, be a better parent, things like that, or, you know, better relationships, all the kind of stuff that the Bible, yes, does talk about it, but the central focus of the scriptures is the work of Jesus to forgive our sins. And so as Christians, sometimes we hear a message so many times, we can ignore it. We just go, yeah, I've heard that before. Jesus forgives me. But here's what I want you to understand is what Paul is saying is not just that Jesus forgives you, but how Jesus forgives you. He doesn't forgive you by the power of you being really sorry. He doesn't forgive you because you feel really guilty. He doesn't forgive you because you did something to make up for it, and you're like, oh, I can write that one off because I did a good thing to cancel out the bad thing. Right, Paul says in verse 7, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, our trespasses, according to what? The riches of his grace. So according to what power, according to what might are you and I forgiven by Jesus? And the answer is by the power of his grace. So not by the power of anything you do, not by the power of anything that I do, not by the power of anything you or I say, it's all by the power of Jesus and his grace that you are forgiven. Here's why this matters and is so practical for you as human beings. It's because the devil wants you to doubt the word of God. When he came along to tempt Adam and Eve, the first thing he said was, did God really say? Did God really say that you are loved? Did God really say that you are forgiven? Not just in a general sense, but did God really say you are forgiven for that specific sin that haunts you, that keeps you up at night, that fills you with regret or guilt or shame. And the devil wants you to go, I don't know. Maybe he didn't. But Jesus and Paul through this letter of Ephesians wants you to know, absolutely he did. Because sometimes if we think that the power of forgiveness rests on if I was good enough, if I was sorry enough, if I confessed it the right way, if I apologized with the right words, you will begin to believe the lies of the devil and you'll begin to doubt whether or not God really loves you and has forgiven you. But if you believe what Paul says, what the word of God, the word of Jesus says, you will look at the words of Satan, the temptations of Satan and say, shut up. You have no power over me. You have no authority. Your accusations mean nothing. Because Jesus has forgiven me by the power of his grace, which is more powerful than you. This is actually very important for us in our daily walk with Jesus. The ability to remember and believe that you are really loved and really forgiven comes down to knowing how you were forgiven. And you and I were forgiven and redeemed from our sins and our trespasses according to the power of Jesus' grace on the cross, not according to the power of anything else. So if Jesus has died on the cross for you, that means you are guaranteed to have been redeemed and forgiven. And this is such 
good news because it sets us free from worry, from doubt, from temptation, from guilt, from shame, from all of it that Satan would throw into our face because we get to respond with the word of God and say, yes, he really did say I was forgiven. And even though I messed up again, even though I apologized and sinned again, even though I repented and fell into temptation again, I know I'm forgiven because it was by the power of Jesus that I'm redeemed and forgiven of all my sins. So he goes on in verse 8. His grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. I love this word, lavish. It means to overflow. Here's the idea. Jesus has given you more grace than you could ever need. Another way of saying it is you can't out God's grace for you. Now that sounds dangerous because you're like, all right, let me test it. All right, that's not the idea, but the idea is this. All of your sins in your past and in your present are forgiven. And all of your sins that are left for you to do in your future because I hate to break it to you, you're probably gonna mess up this week, okay? I, I love you all, I think you're great people, but you're probably not gonna nail it every day this week, all right? Probably gonna slip up, and I am too. Here's the good news of God's lavish grace, of his overflowing grace for you, is that he will love you and keep loving you and keep forgiving you even tomorrow and then next week. See, I think sometimes we fall into this trap as Christians of, oh, of course, Jesus forgives me for my past sins, but what about what I'm going through now? Or what about what's going to happen in the future? And when Paul says, no, he's lavishly poured out his grace on you, he's done it in a way that is overflowing, it means it's more than you could ever use up, it's more than you could ever need, it means that God's grace is greater than your sin. Right? In Romans, Paul says, where sin abounds, Grace abounds all the more, which is his way of saying where there is sin in our lives, God's grace is greater and more overflowing than we could ever need. So it's not that you're going to use up the limit of God's grace and go, okay, I sinned one too many times, and now I've got I to gotta make up for it myself. No, when he says it's lavish grace, it's overflowing grace on you, it means every single time, like the prodigal son, he welcomes you home into his family. He brings you back home and says, I've been waiting for you. He welcomes you with open arms and welcomes you with his love and his grace and his forgiveness. So don't forget later in the week that you're still forgiven and that you are still loved by God and his grace is still for you. He has given it to you in a lavish manner. Verse nine, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. What this is, is God's plan to restore and redeem all things. It is the promise of resurrection. It is the promise that he will make all things right again. In Romans chapter 8, Paul talks about how creation groans under the weight of sin. So it's not just us suffering under the weight of sin. It's all of creation suffering under the weight of sin. And Paul says in Romans 8 that even creation is awaiting God's glory. He's a, it's awaiting God's redemption and resurrection. And so Paul is saying he's going to unite things in heaven and on earth. He's saying he's going to bring it all together. It's not going to be divided anymore. That's not going to be sin or death anymore. Instead, he's going to make it all right. It's going to make it the way it should have been without sin. So you go back to Genesis 1 and 2, how the world was perfect, that we walked with God in the garden. Paul's saying that's what he's doing. He's reuniting us. He's reconciling all things to himself. The book of Revelation ends this way with this beautiful promise from Revelation 21 where he says, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And the former things will pass away. And he's going to get rid of tears. He's going to get rid of crying. He's going to get rid of mourning. He's going to get rid of sorrow and grief. And John hears the words from the throne of heaven. He says, he will make all things new. What's included in all things? Everything in heaven and everything on earth. So we can look at the world we can go, this is a messed up place. There's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of evil. There's a lot of uncertainty. 
And Paul says, but here's our hope as Christians, hope that you and I proclaim to the world, hope that you and I hold on to when the world feels chaotic and feels uncertain. We go, God is working to reconcile all things. He's going to put heaven and earth back together again. He's going to make everything right again. And that sounds amazing to me. Right? When we watch the news, we see what happens in the world and in our country. We go, what is happening Where is the evil coming from? Why won't it stop? And Paul says, here's your hope as Christians. Your hope as Christians, a hope that we can offer the world that is better than any hope the world has, is that God will reconcile and put heaven and earth back together again. That we will be with him forever, united with him, and he will make all things new again. So Christians can react to the chaos of the world differently. Part of our witness to the chaos and the evil of the world and this nation and everywhere else is to not lose our minds and not get caught up in it, but to humbly say we have a hope, we have a peace that goes beyond understanding of circumstances, as the scripture says. People go, why is that? Because we know what our God's going to do. We have a promise from God's word that he's going to reunite and heal all things. He's going to make everything reconciled. He's going to put everything back together the way it should be. And the scriptures, not just Ephesians, but the scriptures of the New Testament are filled with passage after passage of this promise that God is going to restore and make things new again. And that's what we hold on to as Christians. So see, all this fancy theological language is actually incredibly practical for us. Because how many of you ever watched the news and been disconcerned, right? Uncomfortable, a bit nervous, right? A bit worried. And Paul's saying, I have something to ground you, and it's your faith in Jesus that God is going to heal all things. Another way of saying it is that God is sovereign over everything, heaven and earth. So he goes on in verse 11. In him, in Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance, having be, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Right, now it's fancy language, but here is what Paul is saying, that you and I have a promise of salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now here's what the devil wants to do. Again, the devil always wants you and me to doubt the word of God, the promises of God. Did Jesus really die for me? Did Jesus really forgive me? Did Jesus really save me, or was that just for the good people? Right? And here's the good news that Paul is saying is that you and I have a guarantee that you are redeemed and forgiven and saved by Jesus. And he says, here's the guarantee. You have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the down payment, the seal, the official document that your sins are forgiven, that you belong to Jesus, that you have salvation in his name, and nothing's going to take that away from you. That's an amazing promise that you and I should rest in every single day. That no matter how many accusations we come up with our own, no matter how many accusations the devil throws in our face because you and I are still sinners, that the Holy Spirit dwells in you and has sealed your salvation through all eternity. Now, here's the deal. I need you to understand something. The Holy Spirit is God. So what Paul is saying is that God has sealed you up In his hands, he has sealed you up in his salvation, and he's never letting you go. So how many of you think you are bigger and stronger and more powerful than God? How many of you are going to win that wrestling match? But we try. The devil convinces us to try. Think, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not uh, righteous enough. I'm not holy enough. And here's the point. Paul is saying, no, 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 no. It's not about you. It's about who Jesus is and what he has done for you. It's about his grace and his forgiveness and his mercy for you through the cross and resurrection. Here's the promise. When God the Holy Spirit gives you the gift of faith in Jesus 
and he seals you with that gift in holy baptism, he's not letting go of you ever. No matter how much you mess up, no matter if you live like the prodigal son for a while, no matter if you have doubts or shame or guilt or struggles, he's saying you have a guarantee of eternal inheritance. You have a guarantee of eternal life with God the Father because of what Jesus has done and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And I promise you, you are not more powerful than the Holy Spirit. You are not stronger than God. You cannot undo what he has done for you in your life. So here's my hope and prayer for you as your pastor, is that you would trust the promises of God, that you would listen to the word of God over the lies of the devil in your life, that you would walk every day in the grace of Jesus going, I know I'm forgiven, I know I am loved, and that you would rest and not have anxiety or worry or fear about the future because you are sealed with the Holy Spirit for eternal life, and nothing can take that away from you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your promises, for the riches of your grace that you give to us each and every day, the good news that you have forgiven us and you will continue to forgive us in the future. May we trust in your promises of salvation and grace. And may we rest in the promise that you have sealed us in your life and your kingdom forever through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen. I knocked my bulletin over. All right. I invite you to stand as we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We go to our God in prayer. Preserve your church, O Lord, for your name's sake. Answer us in your righteousness and in your faithfulness. Since you have sent us forth in this world to testify to your word, let us find conviction and confidence in our confession that salvation is found in the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ alone. Lord, in your mercy. You, O Lord, are king over all the earth. Spare our nation and its leaders, O Lord. Let the conduct of our civil servants and of our people be wise, just, and honorable in accordance with your holy word. For the sake of Christ, be merciful to those who oppose you, and remember that your desire is to have all be saved through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Emboldened by our adoption through Jesus Christ, O Father, we bring before you every need of body and soul. Lavish the riches of your grace on those who are grieving and mourning. We especially lift up Melinda Heinrich and her family at the passing of her father. May they be comforted by the promise of eternal life and resurrection with you. Lord, in your mercy. You have blessed us, O Father, and your beloved Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. As you have sealed us with the promised Holy Spirit for an eternal inheritance in him, bring us now in repentance and faith to receive his sacrament and be strengthened to everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy. Author of life, as the disciples of John laid his body in a tomb in expectation of the resurrection of the dead, so lead us to respect the bodies of the saints in life and death, at all times confessing by word and deed our confidence in the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, Heavenly Father, join these our prayers and praises with those of your faithful people in every time and every place. Unite them in the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes again on the last day. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we continue our worship by presenting our tithes and offerings.
As we give thanks to God for all his gifts and blessings to us, I invite you to stand as we join together in singing hymn number 805. be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should all times and all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels of all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And the same way also he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
please stand to receive the communion blessing. May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve in your faith to life everlasting. Go in his peace. Amen. We join together in singing thank the Lord. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us with the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Uh, before the blessing and the benediction, a reminder that we are having a voters meeting regarding our construction project today. After service, there will be a time of little time of refreshment and fellowship, but we'll gather as soon as we can to uh, be respectful of every schedule. But if you are a member of our congregation, please, uh, if you can and are able to, make time to stay for that voters meeting as we pray about the future of our congregation and what God is doing here in and amongst us. And so with that, receive the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.